Hi, good morning, everybody. I don't know if everybody can see me or if you can see the presentation. Like I was saying, it's a I joined the, for those new members, I joined the chamber through Coral Gables Trust about a year ago. And I, I, I love all the chambers in Miami, but I have to say that this is probably one of my favorite chambers. And not only because of the amount of work that the chamber does for the community, but I love the outreach that they have not only in Miami Beach, but past Miami Beach. We are in uh, Coral Gables and we have offices in Fort Lauderdale and, Bra and Boca Raton and West Palm Beach, but I feel that in this chamber, you know, you get the word out. And that's why I really enjoy this chamber. So when Deanne and Stephanie called me and approached me and said, oh, we'd love for you to speak, I was really honored. So thank you to both. Um, originally, you know, I asked them, you know, what can we talk about? There's so many different topics in finance and planning and wealth and giving. And they said, well, let's talk about something that's true to your heart. And so I, I, I we can get, if you want to discuss your finances in more detail, I'd be more than happy to consult with you, you know, to talk to you on the side. But today we're going to keep it to a couple of skills that I feel are uh, essential when you're trying to build your wealth. Okay. And I call it the seven steps to redefining your wealth and giving and legacy planning. So, uh, let's see. can somebody move? Because of the Wi Fi, you may have to go out and then come back in. Just one moment. You may want to just get out and go in PowerPoint mode and then. Okay. So let's position ourselves a little bit. I think it's important for those that are data uh, thinkers or that enjoy data. I like uh, reading stuff and understanding how everything works analytically. The survey of consumer finances is a survey that's done on a regular basis. The last one was put out in 2019, and it's by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And there's a link that we can provide for you afterwards. And you can actually go in there, and it allows you to interactively look at some numbers that are key indicators for today. The one that I specifically, or the report that I was specifically interested in was how much wealth do women have today in the United States? And the answer is women hold 11 trillion in assets. Now, the word trillion sometimes is very hard for us as women to put our arms around or as human beings. When somebody says trillion to me, I have to think, well, how many zeros? Well, it's 12 zeros. Right. And that that's a you know, there's 12 zeros in trillion and women hold 11. OK, if you look at this chart, you can still see that when it comes to the asset band, you know, between, let's say, 100 and 250,000, we are catching up to men. OK, you see the difference. So sorry about that. And as you move along, we're well, just going to turn that off. It should have been off. Why it's ringing. Sorry about that. Here, put it that way. <laughs> there you go. And if you look down the chart, and as you get uh, more wealth and more assets over five hundred, over five million and above, you still see that men are have a higher percentage of asset owned than women. And so the share control by women, the percentage overall versus men is about thirty one percent. So there is still some growth for women today to grow when it comes to asset building and, and accruing their wealth and building their wealth. In 2020 alone, women globally lost more than 64 million jobs. Now, people look at me and they're like, well, there's 8 billion people in the world. But think about this. This number is so, so big because that 64 million represent or equals 5% of total jobs held by women worldwide. That is a large number by comparison to 3.9% of men that lost their jobs. The loss of jobs due to the COVID-19 crisis cost women around the world at least 8 billion in earnings. Think about $8 billion that you could, we could have put in a fund altogether and invested that and then redistributed the money around the world, right? That's a lot, that's a lot of money. Data continues to show majority of American women over 50 still do not take an active role in their financial future. That is the case for somebody that's making $75,000 and also the case with somebody who comes into my office with three to six million. It's still, I still see a big gap and, and encourage women to take 
a role in their financial future. Of the roughly 300,000 financial advisors today, only 18% are women. That's not a big number either. The biggest turnoff about finance for women is the jargon. You know, I have to go back and sometimes speak to my investment team and say, you know, dumb it down for me. Explain to me, well, well, how much am I making? You know, what's the return on that? Expense? How long do you want me to keep the money there? Women are feeling more exhausted, burnt out, and under pressure than men. Show of hands. Right? One in four women. <laughs> you can raise your hand. <laughs> One in four women are considering leaving the, uh, the workforce or downshift in their careers versus one in five men, right? Three major women groups have been the most impacted by COVID-19, working mothers, women in senior management positions, that tends to raise an eyebrow, but women in senior management positions have been asked to uh, downsize or have been asked to cut their salaries. You saw in the news yesterday, uh, police officer that was asked and is now having to go back and ask for her money. So, and black and Hispanic women, are we not surprised about that? So positively, let's talk about seven steps that I find are very simple to getting yourself on the right track at any level. Number one, put your money in buckets. And I mean, physical buckets. And we'll talk about that later. Make retirement your top priority. That is the hardest one on these seven steps. When you're 20 years old, I just did a panel for the Women in Wealth about a year and a half ago. We had Generation Z students in their students between the age of 19 and 22. Surprisingly to me, they want to retire by the age of 40. So when you talk about retirement <laughs> to them, they, they're by the age of 40, they want their homes paid off, no loans, and they want to be climbing Moab, Utah and going to Yellowstone. You talk to somebody that's a millennial in their 30s, they're still struggling to figure out what their retirement is going to be. And you have a lot of people in their 50s or 60s who actually don't even know how they're going to pay for their retirement. And that could get sick and not know how to pay their bills. Create an emergency fund. Creating an emergency fund does not mean using your credit card when you need it. And a lot of women are like, oh, I have this credit card. It's all paid off. If I have an emergency, I'm going to use it. That's not what an emergency fund is. So create an emergency fund. Find a wealth building buddy. So birds of a flutter, flock, uh, flock together. Is that the saying? I'm mm -hmm. French, so sometimes I get my sayings okay. messed up. Um, I used to say rain cats and dogs and people just are <laughs> rain horses and pigs and they were like, what? <laughs> so um, find a wealth building buddy. We'll talk about that, but uh, find, you know, Women, we tend to join groups, right? If you like cooking, you're going to join friends that love to cook together. If you like wine, you're going to join a wine group. Well, surround yourself with women that like to save. Surround yourself with a supportive system of women that are like-minded like you when it comes to your finances. You lift each other up. Financially educate yourself. That's a hard one, right? Sometimes we don't have the time. And again, some of these, sometimes you read and you're still trying to figure out what's being said, but feel free to reach out. There is a lot of help out there and, and it can start with very basic language. Protect your assets. No, I don't mean wrap your dollars underneath your, my, your mattress and cellophane. Some people are like, oh yeah, I have some money. You know, people still do that. I mean, make sure that you have the right insurance the right health insurance. Make sure you have the right homeowner's insurance. Because if you do get sick, you need to be covered. You don't want to deplete what you've been saving for your entire life. So you have to protect your assets. Invest long-term. Show of hands, how many people think long-term is three to five years? <laughs> Good, it isn't. It's 15 to 20. Once you invest long-term, leave it there. The market will fluctuate and we'll talk about that. But if you really want to save and you really want to build your wealth, you have to mentally leave that consumer mentality and save. And, and I say this all the time and people nod their heads, but that's a, it's not that easy. It's easy to say and not that easy to do. Number one, put your money in buckets. What does that mean? So Can you guys still see or hear? Oh, there you go. These are my buckets. 
When I say put your money in buckets, I physically mean go to Party City and buy yourself a couple of buckets. I like gold, but you can buy them red, blue, orange, whatever your choice is of buckets. Find a spot in your house and start dividing how much you save, how much you spend, how much you give to charity, what is your you know, long-term emergency fund, put it in a bucket. Now, at first you're gonna say, oh my God, where am I gonna put them? And do you really want me to do that? But the answer is yeah, there are studies that show that when you place your savings and your spendings in buckets, in categories, you end up saving more money. It's tangible to you. So believe it or not, you've got a couple of buckets, right? So what's my week's point? My weakest point is my life is Amazon. Victor's on the phone. If Victor could talk, there's at least 10 packages of Amazon that creep up. I don't know how they land there, but they're on, the, on my front porch every week. And so physically, if I take that and I write down on a white little piece of paper, okay, I spent $35 on slippers. I spent $25 on this thing that turns and squirts. I spent 30, you know, by the time that I'm done, I've spent $800 a month on Amazon. So one thing is, you know, me doing it and I see it on my statement, but when I go in my bucket and I actually see the $800, what's the first thing that I do? I literally... No, I take all those packages, repackage them back, and I go to the UPS store, return, 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 return. And I take my little pieces of paper, I make it fun, and I cross it out, and they go into my savings. And so when you're putting all your different savings and spendings in buckets, it can become fun. And women sometimes forget to do that. You know, finances, you know, it's not very sexy, but it can be fun. So please, this is the number one thing. If anybody today leaves with something is go buy some buckets, mm -hmm. take the time to sit down on the weekend, write down on a piece of paper, all your buckets. And that's gonna give you a real visual of where you are at any level, whether you're making $35,000 or whether you have 3 million in your bank account. You'd be surprised how one of those buckets could be $2 million for an apartment but when you see those $2 million in a bucket, you tell yourself, wow, do I really need those two, you know, do I really need a $2 million apartment? Do I really need to spend $1,500 on a gorgeous, you know, Louis Vuitton purse? Really? So, you know, I know society, uh, you know, there's all, a whole psychology to spending that we won't go into with women. But uh, again, put your, put your spending and your savings in a budget. Oh, and gift. I have the third budget as gift and charity because I think the people that here know that that's really important to me. I have three charities that I give to every month. It's on autopilot. It doesn't matter what happens to me. That's my way of contributing back. So if you don't have a bucket for charity, create a bucket for charity. If that's $5, $1, it doesn't matter. Whatever you contribute, it, it's a good thing. Number two, make a retirement, make retirement your priority. Like I was saying, that's the hardest thing to do, you know, planning and saving for a long-term goal. The first thing I'm going to say, and it's not number one here, but I'm going to add it before I read some stats is what is your retirement goal? I ask people, when do you want to retire? And they're like, oh, I don't know. What is your goal? Write it on a piece of paper. You know, when you want to lose weight, you put a beautiful picture in your refrigerator or you set yourself a goal. The same thing with your retirement. I want to retire when I'm 65. I'm going to be 52 years old. I know that I have another 12, 15 years of work, but I want to retire when I'm 65. That is my goal. And I have that in my mind and I have that written down. So I'm saving towards that goal. In 2019, a study by the National Council of Aging found that among women, those aged 60 and older... 60% worry healthcare costs will exceed their retirement income. 59% worry about losing their independence. I have women that come in my office that have been married for 33 years and now end up alone, divorced. 52% worry about becoming a burden to their families. I fall under that category. My mom had Alzheimer's, my uncle had Alzheimer's, my grandfather had Alzheimer's. My biggest fear is, do I become a burden for my son and my husband? I don't want to. I want to make sure that we have enough saved enough from a health insurance perspective, from a 24 nursing care. If, if I did get sick with Alzheimer's, that I wouldn't pass on that burden to my family. 
So maximize your contributions while you're working. I know that when you're a job, it's very difficult, whether you have an IRA, or whether you have a 401k, maximize your contribution. Don't spend the money on the Louis Vuitton purse. Put it in there, put it in there. Take advantage of holistic and collaborative approaches. I find that in the finance world, sometimes financial advisors tend to work in a silo. And I, we're the opposite, at least in my firm and me, we work so collaborative. There is not one client that does not come into my office that doesn't bring their accountant, their attorney, their children, their brother, their sister, their friend. I encourage everybody. It's a conversation to have with all. So that collaborative, holistic approach to your finances is important. If that means that you want to talk it over with your buddy system, go right ahead. But that's what you need to do. You can read the rest of the points. I know we're time sensitive, but one that stands out the most is, you know, okay. One that stands out the most is um, determine whether your planned spending rate is sustainable. That is a big one. We have clients that come in the office and are recently divorced and they have a big stash of cash in the bank, right? And so they see this big number, right? But then they have plans to travel here and then they have plans to buy a home here and then they have, a, and, and it's very difficult. You know, you, you have to have the composure to say, I don't think that's a sustainable lifestyle. You, you, you have to think of what can I do you know, and don't think it as, you can live well and live simply. You can live well and save. Miami is difficult, right? People measure their success by what they wear. You know, walk in with a big Chanel purse. Ooh, I've made it. But think about the fact that if you had put that money in an investment account, the return on that, right? So you have to think of determining whether your planned spending rate was sustainable. Look, I'm the first one. If you would have spoken to me 20 years ago, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a work in progress like all of you. So that's what you have to remember. You're, a, you're not in this alone. No financial advisor is perfect. We've all had our rises and failures in life and we've learned from them. And that's why we can come back and give you the good advice because we've been there. You've been at the bottom. I was there in 2008, squabbling. You know, we've all been there but we pick ourselves back up and we save, we save, we save, we save. Number three, create an emergency fund. Again, an emergency fund is not the credit card that you've paid off. Forget your emergency fund. That is a separate gold bucket. An emergency fund is money that you put aside every month that you are going to invest separately from your savings. It's totally separate. If you want it to be successful, you have to mentally separate the two. And you put your money in that bucket in the emergency fund, and that could be physical. If you wanna stuff that bucket with $100 bills every month, I have an emergency little Ziploc. That's my bucket. It's on the right-hand side of my bed. One day my husband was saying something and I took out $300. He goes, where'd you get that from? I go, it's an emergency fund. It's whatever I save. If I find $5 in my jeans, boom, it goes in the emergency fund. It doesn't go back in my, in my wallet. So that's what I mean, you know. Number one, break the pay to paycheck cycle. I know that's very difficult. I, I, I think out of everything in this slide, this is the most difficult to do, to pay, especially today with COVID-19, with people trying to grasp their careers and, and you have different sources of income coming in, right? You're doing events, you're doing insurance. You're all trying, we're all trying to survive, right? But you can still break the pay to pay. Pay to paycheck to paycheck cycle. Just do it. Again, go back to those buckets. Right when you see yourself doing something, stop. Take the little piece of paper, push, switch it to the savings bucket and walk away. Um, pretend it doesn't exist. I've said that already. The emergency fund, it's not to go travel. I often hear this from a client. Oh, well, I have some money. It's my emergency fund, but I'm going to take a three-week trip to Africa. Those $30,000, that's not your emergency fund. Your emergency fund is in case something really, really bad happens. And it happens to everybody. Turn saving into a competition for yourself. And I do that, that with my emergency fund. It's kind of fun to see how much I can put in there all the time. And I like to compete with myself. It's like golf or any sport, right? 
I want to make myself better. So I'll put five and I'll put 20 and I'll put 30 and you make it fun and you become competitive with yourself. Invest your savings separate from your emergency fund. I said that that's a big mistake. A lot of people do. You've got to separate that into a separate bucket. Step four, a financial buddy. So of course here, I'm going to feature three years ago. I'll just tell you the story. Jim Davidson, who is our CEO and he's you know, you have your mentors. He is my mentor. And he approached me. Um, we had a, um, she's now a client who came into the office at the time, had gone through a, a severe divorce and was not in tune with any of the finances. Her husband had been managing everything, placed everything in LLCs. It was, you know, from a trust perspective, she walked in and her hands were really tied. And I think that really impacted everybody in the conference room. You know, we deal with a lot of people like that. And most, a lot of my clients are single women or divorced women that come, you know, through different referrals. And Jim approached me with John, our managing director and said, Chris, you know, can you start something where we try to educate and help women and, and, and start a support system for women? And my first speaker was Samaria Hudson from Chapman Partnership. Now, I don't know if you guys heard Samaria Hudson, but she, you want a powerhouse? I mean, she used to run a $1.8 billion fund, you know, health company out of London. And she walked in with a, top, a topic about self-worth and valuing yourself in the business. And at first, everybody in the office was like, well, we're not talking about finance. And my response was, I don't think anybody wants to talk about finance. I think there's so much that we want to talk about because when you're mentally well here and you're mentally well here, then it all kind of clicks. And so we've had different topics. It's a support system. We started with 12 women in a conference room and I hope all of you will join. We're over almost a thousand women that talk to one another. And whenever there's a woman in well seminar series I have an average of maybe a hundred to 200 women on the call. And we talk about many different topics. And I think, you know, finding your buddy. So going back to another thing is if you have a friend that you know is in your same situation and somebody who has the eagerness to save, somebody who's going to tell you, listen, I, I'd love to go with you traveling, but I want to save, you know, I'm concerned. I want to put the $3,000 down, you know, and invest that. That's the person you want to hang around with. It's great. And all the other things are wonderful, but surround yourself with people that are like-minded, people that are thinking like you. That's going to help elevate yourself. Very important. Financially educate yourself. Again, break your consumer mentality. I cannot stress that enough. Difficult, right? Again, um, understand the basics of budgeting and you do that with your buckets. It sounds so silly, right? But I'm gonna encourage everyone today in this conference room and everybody on the Zoom, I want you to go to Party City and I want you to buy buckets. I don't care if they're this big, and I want you to lay them down on a table and I want you to open up your bank statement and I want you to start putting for this month of August your buckets together. And then email me. Tell me what you've learned in the process. I'd love for you to email me and tell me what you've learned in the process. Um, financial planning is very important. We have an arm in our office of financial planning where we sit down and dissect the needs of the clients. That happens at all levels. If you need to sit down with somebody and you're still not sure where you work, you're still not sure when you want to retire, what your retirement goal is, will I be making enough money? You know, one of the things that um, uh, Jerry asked me a, a very good question, and I wanted to, to talk about this because people ask this question all the time in, in retirement. What is the recommended re percentage retirement, right? So most people are going to tell you that you have to save between eight and 10 percent, okay? of your pre-taxed income, eight to 10%. So what does that mean? That means that if you're making $80,000, right? And you've set yourself a goal of retirement, you have to save eight to 10 times your salary in order to feel comfortable for your retirement. So think about that. You make $75,000. If you're at a higher bracket, by the time that you retire, for you to feel comfortable, you have to have $750,000 comfortable. And it's, it's workable, it's doable. You've got years to put aside, years to maximize your 401ks, years to invest long-term, 
and years to save your money, but that's the number you want, okay? Protect your assets. Protecting your assets is, is like I was saying earlier, very, very important. If you, insurance is a, a topic of conversation as we all know in this country, but there are ways for you to make sure that you have some protection, right? And you have to have the right health insurance. And if you don't, then it's a, it's a tough conversation, but you need to find a good health insurance. Because if something happens to you and you've saved $100,000 and you get sick, that's gone. And you don't even wanna do that. You're hoping that you've saved and put all of that in your emergency fund. So you're not even touching your savings. You don't want to take out from your 401k. You want to leave that. You, you don't want to go back to your account and be like, okay, I got to take out my investments and be taxed on those investments. And it becomes a real headache. So insurance is important. Homeowners insurance. Homeowners insurance is very important. Hurricanes, earthquake. I was just in Alaska two weeks ago. And my husband and I kept talking about earthquakes. We leave, boom. Eight point what, two? I mean, you have to take into consideration all the different asset protections that are in place so that you're not depleting your savings and that you're not depleting. I know it's a lot. I know there's a lot of balls and we're all like, well, that's easy to say. And I'm just making this amount of money and I have a family and I have a home. But again, do the exercise, go and get your buckets. When you put your little notes in your buckets, clarity starts occurring. Um, Investing long term. You can start with a tax advantage retirement, you know, through your 401k or through your IRA. We were talking about that earlier. Um, but again, the only way that you can invest long term is by what? Saving. Save, save, save. It's the hardest thing for anybody to do. Um, Historically, the stock market has gone up over time. You know, there's all these disclaimers with that. But remember, the market doesn't move in a linear fashion. It's up and down, right? And, and you've got to hold on to that. And you've got to expect volatility. And if you have a few investments, you have to ride them out. When you've invested 15, 20 years from now, you'll be okay. You know, I suffered some big losses in 2008. I'm okay. So that's what you have to know. And the other thing is, if you do have a balanced portfolio, you must understand your portfolio. A lot of women do not sit down with their financial advisor and ask them what's in their portfolio. You have to make sure that it's diversified. And if you don't know what that word diversified means in investment, you have to ask the question. What does that mean? Why is my money in international equities? What does that mean? Why is my money in ETFs? Why is my money in an emerging market? What does that mean? You'd be surprised how many women walk into my office and I'm like, oh, I don't know. Well, he's there, there, there. My money is invested. In what and how? Are you over invested? We review portfolios with my investment officer, Mason, who I think is on the call, and, and Michael. And we find sometimes that women are over invested in many categories. They shouldn't have been in there. So please ask the question. Don't be scared to ask those questions if you don't understand the language. Educate yourself, that's part of your education. Each of these seven steps are simple concepts, right? I wanna go back to them if I can, just so we can review them. Put your money in what? Okay, what are you gonna do today? Yes, you too, gentlemen. Men can also do this. Number two, make retirement your what? set a date of right when's your date of retirement um 67 67 when's your date of retirement 62 when's your date of retirement when's your date of retirement cleo 45 45 that means that you're doubling up every month that means that you're aggressively saving that's where you want to be 
right? If you're saving $100 and next month you're saving 200. And the month after that, you're saving what? 400. So just to give you an idea, let's just say that you're making $75,000, right? And you want to save at least 80%, okay, um, of your pre-retirement income, 80%, okay? So assume that, you know, you're saving and your return on your investment is, I'm going to say 6%, which is average, that's not very aggressive, right? An inflation rate about 3%. You would need to save, if you're making $75,000, $2,155 per month to meet your goal to retire at 45. There's your bucket, right? Your bucket is $2,155,000 a month that you need to save. If you're thinking of 80%, right, of pre-retirement income, and you're making $75,000. You're going to look at me, you're going to say, oh my God, that's, you can do it. You can do it. You'd be surprised how many Amazon packages you can return, how many purses you don't need to buy, how you don't need to have three cars in a house, how you don't need to be paying the $600, $800 Audi. You don't need that. Just think, if I can put $2,155 in that saving bucket every single month for the next 20 years, so that's your goal. Um, create an emergency fund. It's not your credit card. <laughs> Find a wealth building buddy. <laughs> I'm your wealth building buddy. We are all wealth building buddies, right? This is the buddy system. And then it, you know, right? You're nodding. Financially educate yourself. We're gonna have somebody who's gonna talk about crypto, but it's with everything. Ask the question. If today, if there's one thing that you can, another thing that you can come out of this today, if you can come out of this today, that makes you make a phone call to your financial advisor tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Hey, Pedro, how are you? I know you have some of my investments, but what am I invested in? What does that mean? Oh, well, no, you know, you know, because we uh, have a team. No, no, I, I know that, but can I meet with you? I want to understand how my money is working. Don't be shy. I don't care. He shouldn't care if you have $50,000 and he shouldn't care if you have $3 million. In my office, even though our minimums honestly are half a million, I have people that come in with 200, 250,000. You know why? Because I know that they're saving 50,000 every single year. They've promised me or they've, they've put money and that $200,000 account is now a 700,000, almost a million dollar account. So ask the question. It doesn't matter. If he doesn't want to meet with you, come meet with us. We'll sit down. We'll tell you exactly how your money is being invested. Financially educate yourself. That's what we're talking about. Protect your assets. And the last one, invest how? Long term. That means long, like all, all the way on the other side of this conference room. And if you follow these seven steps and you do, it's like a skincare program, right? How many times have you, I've bought skincare and I never follow the steps. And then I start getting pimples here. And then this side is too dry. And I go, ah, this thing, this shit doesn't work. And then my friend is like, well, did you follow the steps? Well, these are steps that work. They've worked for me. They're simple. If you follow these seven steps and you stick to this, we'll talk in five or 10 years and you'll tell me, gosh, I've seen a difference in my savings and in my investments. I, I feel it. So I want to thank everybody. My information is on here. And uh, thank you so much. You. And now it's your turn. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.